Please welcome Desmond Mead, the leader of the Campaign to Restore Voting Rights to the Formerly Incarcerated in Florida. Back with the Atlantic's Matt Thompson. So Desmond, is that welcome a test? <laughs> you are coming off quite a year. You know, I also, I grew up in Central Florida, but I had never had the distinction of being a finalist for Central Floridian of the Year as you are this year. I, my biggest accolade was third place in the Seminole County Spelling Bee. So congratulations. congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. You know, um, I, uh, I'm just like real humbled by a lot of this. You know, because I, I remember um, in August of 2005 when I was standing in front of railroad tracks uh, waiting on a train to come so I could jump in front of it. You know, cause I was homeless. I was addicted to drugs, recently released from prison. And I knew that my parents didn't raise me to be in that position, but there I was. And so to go from a space where I felt that I was a disappointment to my family, particularly to my mother, and to be in the space like I am now is, is, is amazing, but it's humbling. And I, you know, as I was driving here, I was thinking, I wish my mom could still be alive to actually just see this, you know, yeah. be with me. She would have been sitting right here. <laughs> yeah. Now, having grown up in Central Florida, I was uh, raised Catholic, but spent a lot of my time with the Southern Baptist Convention. And I got to tell you, when I heard about the beginning of the campaign for Amendment 4, I didn't think it would work. <laughs> uh, I, having been in the community that I was in in Central Florida, I said, there's no way Florida is going to do this, much less 64% on a bipartisan vote. Why? How, it, how did that happen? It wasn't supposed to work, Matt. You know, to be honest with you, when you, especially when you think about it, you know, that you talk about an issue like uh, felon disenfranchisement uh, that has a, a, a history and in, 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 in racial animus, uh, when you talk about voting and when you talk about the state of Florida, <laughs> those are like three toxic um, <laughs> uh, uh, subjects. And then to think about the political climate that we're in where there's so much hate and there's so much fear and division, you know, that it, we were never supposed to be on the ballot. We were never uh, supposed to be successful. But you started out talking about the Baptist Convention and being a, a Catholic. You know, one of the things that, that I am not ashamed of saying, it is, especially with, with due respect to folks who may not have um, um, a religious preference or maybe atheist or whatever. I, I'm not, right? And, and uh, I consider myself um, a Christian. And, and, and I tell folks that this campaign was ordained by God. It was, it was a vision that God gave me um, you know, years ago. And from day one, uh, I had some seasoned prayer warriors that every morning at five and seven would get on a, a prayer line to lift up this campaign in prayer. And this campaign from start to finish divide, I mean, it, it, it really defied conventional thinking. Yeah. Um, and we were able to do some amazing things and we were able to get unlikely allies. I um, want to stick with, I want to stick with the allies for a moment. The, you know, as, as a Catholic, one of our big messages to the world is forgiveness were we um how how was the church as a partner so i'm glad work? i'm glad you're a catholic that's asking that question <laughs> right so so i could say you know to be honest with you um that was a disappointment for a personal disappointment for me because i would expect you know that the church uh to be the first one on board uh, uh particularly the catholic church because i remember going around and and even when i talked to anyone that was a person of faith because you remember, Florida had this uh, clemency policy that made a person wait five or seven years before they're allowed to even apply to have their rights restored. And then after they apply, they have to wait sometimes as long as 15 years just to get a no. And I always go back to when I talk to a person of faith, I always go back to the story of when Jesus was on the cross. And there was a criminal that asked him to be saved. And I always say, Jesus didn't tell him he had to wait five or seven years. You know, what he said was this day. And that interchange between Jesus and the felon, right, what it spoke to, it, it, it spoke to the heart of all faith, 
whether it was Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, it spoke to this concept of forgiveness, redemption, and restoration. And so I knew that this issue was a natural fit for a people of faith. And, and at the end, we, we, I think we ran the largest uh, faith-based en engagement uh, a campaign where we had over 827 institutions of faith that participated in a Let My People Vote campaign, right, for Amendment 4. And we had Jewish synagogues. We had Islamic mosques. We had conservative Christians. We had Latino evangelicals. We had the traditional African-American churches. Did you have Catholics? All, we... <laughs> there may have been some there. Um, but, you know, yeah, their, their endorsement came rather uh, disappointingly late. Um, but, you know, on board, uh, the first denomination on board was the AME Church mm. uh, that was actually led by uh, Bishop Richardson yeah. in the 11th uh, Episcopal District. And then you had other smatterings of churches, and then like the, uh, the Latino Evangelicals, NALIC, yeah. uh, they got on board once they was approached. Um, and so I was very um, yeah. just moved by by the amount of congregations that were engaging. And then we had, um, I know, God, I, I cannot think of the name, but the RAC, right? Reform, um, ah, come on, somebody help me out there. <laughs> uh, it's a Jewish we'll, federation, a national Jewish federation. We'll, we'll encourage folks to yeah, look it up. Now, your, will, our session this morning is called um, the power of experience. And so I want to turn to your experience for a moment. Before I do, I want to show a brief video just about a little oh. bit about Amendment 4 in the campaign. Uh, tonight in Florida that is important. Amendment 4, that passed. So whatever happens tonight, that amendment is going to be hugely important for voting rights in Florida. This country was able to see that love won the day in Florida. We were able to transcend partisan politics and racial anxieties and organize people along the lines of humanity. We were able to bring together people from all backgrounds, from all walks of life, from all political persuasions, under a common cause that once a debt is paid, is paid. There's still more work to be done, and we're looking forward to walking along with our partners and allies as we continue to expand democracy, not only in the state of Florida, but throughout this country. So we see in that last frame in that video, tears of, I assume, joy on your face. And, um, but this journey, or this phase of your journey, this stage of your journey, began in a very different place. Um, uh, take us for a moment, if you would, to August, the fall of 2005, summer of 2005. Yeah, so... You know, that day was, it was, a, it was a hot, humid day, but I was actually able to block out that heat and humidity because the only thing that was going through my mind was how much pain I was going to feel. Mm. That train hit me. And uh, you were standing. On I was standing right there waiting. Oh, and waiting even the thought about the pain that I would have to go through was not enough to make me move. And I still stood there and I waited and I waited and I waited. You know, but God had other plans, you know, and um, I ended up crossing those tracks and I, I walked a couple blocks further and there was a place, a central intake facility that allowed me to uh, get into a drug program. And after completing that, I moved into a, a homeless shelter. And while there, you know, my goal was uh, just to not use drugs again. And I wanted to do something. Um, and so I enrolled in college, um, Miami-Dade College, and I did extremely well. And uh, eventually I uh, got accepted into law school. And 
how, what was the role of that experience in making all of this possible? How did that experience play into the work? <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that, one of the first things that, that uh, it, it taught me that, that just going through that experience. And now I, I realize, you know, and I look back now at the things that I've gone through and the things that used to cause me shame, right? Uh, it it kind of now, you know, I, I throw my shoulders back a little bit because I realized that God had chosen me to take me through some things in order to be of greater service to him. Right. Because sometimes if you haven't gone through some things, it's hard for you to you no know, more give a testimony. Right. And then the second thing is hard for you to really connect. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to be at that rock bottom place allowed me to understand something that we've known for quite some time, but we really don't act on it like we should. And that is we've always heard that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And that same concept applies to our community, to our country. That, you know, if we really want to be, uh, uh, aspire to be this great country, that we have to empower those that is weakest among us. And, and, and part of that group are people who have been uh, vilified and, and, and have been the scourge of the earth. People with felony convictions, you know, and, and, and so, or, or the people that were homeless, the people that were uh, hooked on drugs or, or, or our foster care system, you know. And so I knew that, that, there had to be special attention on what can we do to uplift uh, people in those categories. What can we uplift? Uh, what can we do to uplift people that's traditionally been looked at as the weakest in, in our society, knowing that if we invest in them, we invest in ourselves. Right. And so I think I was able to really uh, uh, parlay that message in multiple ways. Right. And, and one of them being uh, like Amendment 4, understanding that. That, that Amendment 4 wasn't just about the person with the felony conviction that wanted to vote. Amendment 4 was about our society. Amendment 4 was about each and every individual that paid less to educate their child than to incarcerate the individual. You know, Amendment 4 was about what we wanted our community to be. Yeah. Now, one of the many partners that you had in this work was a man that some would describe as an unlikely partner, um, uh, uh, white a uh, politically Republican guy, um, uh, Neil Voles, um, who had a different entryway into this conversation. Um, uh, Neil had had the experience of, of having been convicted of a felony, um, uh, which awakened him to the reality of life after that conviction um, and it inflamed him also with a passion for the work that you, you did together. Um, some might hear that story and say, but you know what? He was convicted of a white collar crime. Um, one of the parts of the education that, that several journalists certainly in DC have had over the, the past couple of years has been about the spread of white collar crime, Jesse Isinger's book uh, uh, about how under prosecuted white collar crime is. And some might say that that crime should be more prosecuted. So more people would have that experience with the criminal justice system. What, would that be an argument that you would share? No, it wouldn't be. And, and the, re the reason why it wouldn't be because um, when even just hearing this question now, you know, that's not what's going through my head. What's going through my head is, and I think that, and, and I don't want it to come off as a critique of, of the work that we're doing, but I think more of a, a of a, an adjustment, all right, or, or suggestion, I should say, is that sometimes we do uh, uh, separate these things. So when I looked at Neil, I didn't see someone who was convicted of a, a white collar crime who may not have. I didn't even know that he didn't do any jail time until we were on Samantha B together. Mm. You know, and I, uh, folks who've seen it, seen my reaction, it was just a natural reaction <laughs> where I just rolled my eyes. I was like, wow, you know, but I, I didn't see that. What I seen was another human being who was convicted of a felony offense that suffered some collateral consequences, right? And, and so part of this process is showing me that, for instance, in Florida, uh, less than 25% of people who are convicted of a felony offense are sentenced to prison, all right? And so my thing was, do I focus on the less than 25% and build a narrative around them? 
or do I include everyone? Because guess what? We're, even though you've never been to prison, if you're convicted of a felony offense, you face basically the same collateral consequences. The only thing that you probably haven't experienced is the trauma of being incarcerated. But when you're, when you're through with your sentence, you still can't vote, still can't get a job, you still face uh, housing discrimination, you know, and, and you're still wearing that red letter, a uh, scarlet letter of, of shame of being a felon. And so, you know, I, you know, when we, especially particularly around Amendment 4, understanding that I cannot, you know, uh, devalue anyone's personal experience with the criminal justice system, right? Because then you'll have people say, well, man, you only did four years. I did 40. And then you'll have, well, I did eight. I did 45. So, you know, I, I'm more deserving than you or whatever. I think, no, what it is, is that holistically when we look at things, we're able to understand that there is something inherently wrong with the system. Uh, and particularly when it related to Amendment 4, the, uh, uh, the, the, the phrase, one of the things that we used was, listen, when the debt is paid, it's paid. Whether a person was in prison, whether a person was not. And as it turns out, the majority of the people uh, were not sentenced to prison. And that drastically shifted uh, the focus on who Amendment 4 was benefiting, which I think was very critical in helping us to pass Amendment 4. Um, I'm going to turn to our audience in a moment with a question, but before I do, uh, the, the same eve, that same election that brought um, Amendment 4 into power um, was one that uh, happened in a context in which Amendment 4 being the biggest expansion of voting rights since the Voting Rights Act, I believe, um, uh, it was one in which the Voting Rights Act was also under its greatest, some of its greatest challenges mm -hmm. since it was first enacted nationwide. Mm -hmm. um, voting rights across the country um, uh, saw a pretty different picture even in that election and in, in the run-up to it and in the aftermath of it. What do you take away from both of these things happening at once, Amendment 4 passing in Florida and at the same time, voter rights under duress across the country? <laughs> That's a great question, right? Um, I, I, I think that, um, and, and I've been telling folks, I think that there are a lot of lessons to be learned in the Amendment 4 victory. Some of which I, I haven't learned yet, you know, so I'm still evaluating uh, uh, what happened. But there were some top line things that happened there. Uh, we knew that we had over 5.1 million votes, which was a million more votes than any candidate on the ballot that received. Mm. Right. That's number one. Um, and then number two was was that we know we, we're 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 guessing that at least a million of the people who voted for Amendment 4 also voted for our current governor, Ron DeSantis, right? Which showed a shift because typically, uh, 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 in, in especially in progressive spaces, there have been this uh, a dilemma about trying to figure out how to get people to stop voting against their self-interest, right? And Amendment 4 showed that we were able to actually crack that nut where people were voting for what was right above their political preferences, above whatever racial anxieties they may have, they voted for their self-interest. And then the other thing was, was that when we looked at those 5.1 million votes, uh, particularly in this era, in this environment, that none of those votes was based on hate, none was based on fear, but they were rather 5.1 million votes that were based on love and forgiveness. And I, and, and I am so adamant about really highlighting the fact that on November 6th, that this country got to actually see love win in the day. And I think that that is extremely important. I think it speaks to how we can, there is an avenue to take issues because I think one of our, one of our biggest a uh, 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 fault is sometimes we politicize things that are just about about humanity, right? And and any time that there's political bickering, the people always suffer, right? And so how do we take some basic values, human values, and and, and organize around those values in a way that would transcend partisan divide or bickering and, and racial anxieties? How do we get to that space, like? You know, it's a space that we see in the aftermath of natural, natural disasters. 
Like when the hurricane hit Texas, one of the most riveting scenes that I witnessed was when you had an African-American man that was rescuing a white man in Texas, right? And stopped to let him get his Confederate flag, right? And but for understanding what that Confederate flag meant, but for that moment, this man was able to overlook that because before he's seen the Confederate flag, he's seen another human being in need. You know, when we see an accident on the road and we see somebody laying down and we stop and we run out, our first question is not, did you vote for Donald Trump? <laughs> our first question is, are you okay? How can I help? You know, and it's in those moments where we are connecting along the lines of humanity that, 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 that we are powerful, that we are great. You know, that, that humanity is beautiful. And so that's what I personally want to focus on. How do we get there? You know, how do we get there and move major political controversial issues like felon voting? Right? How do we do that with other things? Whether it's immigration, whether it's, you know, uh, other issues that, 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 that are important to folks. How do we bring people together from all walks of life along those lines and leave all of the partisan bickering to politicians? You know, we take matters in our own hands and we just go ahead and we come to the aid of our fellow human being. Uh, whether they're white, black, young, old, rich, poor, Democrat or Republican, we fought just as hard for the person that wished he could have voted for Donald Trump as we did for the person that wanted to vote for Barack Obama. When you make that movie, it's going to make win Best Picture. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want to start? Good morning. My name is Tiffany Dina Lofton. I'm the National Director for the Youth and College Division at the NAACP. It's a pleasure to see you. Thank you for accepting the invitation to attend this event. Um, you're a revolutionary pioneer, and in the work that folks have been trying to do for a very long time, particularly in the South, you have set a trend, not a bar, not a floor, not a roof. And I'm sure that moving forward, we're gonna hear a lot more from you about the lessons that you learned in the organizing and the strategy that you put together to help make this successful. Um, I have two quick questions. One, can you say who were your biggest opponents? Not the biggest haters, mm -hmm. but the biggest opponents who were actively organizing against you in Amendment 4. Um, I was in Tallahassee on the night of the victory, and uh, I was at FAMU's campus, and we, we had the, the, the speech from Andrew Gillum after we had heard about Amendment 4, and the, the binary like, of how we felt was just overwhelming. I'll talk to you about it later. Yeah. Um, so that's question A, who are your biggest opponents? And uh, question number two was, uh, now the implementation process is important, right? Uh, leading up into gubernatorial races that are happening in Louisiana, Kentucky, and, um, and uh, Mississippi, and uh, folks who want to continue to try to do the same movement that you did in spaces where we know that gerrymandering is taking place and redistricting is taking place. Uh, what help do you need in the implementation process that folks can uh, take note of now to help you prepare for that work and that other states can lead by example? Let's do biggest opponent first. <laughs> Ah, you would want to get to that. Of one. course. <laughs> so, you know, I, ironically, um, we did not have any opposition. Believe that? Mm -hmm. Any opposition that was actively campaigning against us. All right. But I can say that the, the, the biggest hurdles or the biggest obstacles that we've had to overcome came from internal came from allies and friends, to be totally honest, you know, um, at the end of the day. And so that really speaks to what I believe is a central part in, in really doing some work in even different states is that I believe, and you mentioned the word that, what was it, uh, a revolutionary? Revolutionary pioneer. Revolutionary <laughs> pioneer. And I do believe that in order for there to be a revolution, it must be an internal revolution. Um, and if we're not willing and, 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 and courageous enough to be radical internally, to look at what our shortcomings are, because what I've noticed is that the opposition, in, in my experiences, is we've given the opposition way too much power. We've acquiesced a lot of our power to oppos opposition, when the reality is the solutions that that, 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 that can change that are, lies within us and how we operate and how we deal with people. First of all, you know, it, it is no small feat that one of the biggest things that uh, uh, biggest weights that I carried on my shoulder um, 
was about the fact that I was an African-American man leading a major movement, that that is not something that is like readily accepted in our circles. Right. And, and I carried that weight. And I was like, man, please, God, let me win this, because if I don't, then they'll say, well, that's why people of color can't lead major movements. Right. And so the, even things like that, understanding that there is so much talent. Right. And, 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 and skill set within people who are directly impacted. You know, we talk about uh, uh, keeping people at the center of the movement. Right. And we have to do more than just talk about it. We have to do more than just have them be talking heads. But there are people that are closest to the pain that has a skill set and have the capabilities of being at the table devising strategy and policy right? and policy. So speaking of policy, talk, turn to implementation. For, for well, a implementation. All right. So here's the thing. Right. We always talk about creating a more inclusive democracy. I'm still in this internal revolution. Right. Well, there's two things that 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 you know we talk about creating a more inclusive democracy, and then one of the things that we always attach to 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 uh, politics is voter registration, right? Um, when we talk about creating a more inclusive democracy, right, we we cannot be uh, uh, hypocritical. That means if we want to create a more inclusive democracy, that's for who? Just people that look like me, or people that might think like me. Because if that's the case, then that's not a more inclusive democracy, right. right? That means that I have to understand that every able-bodied citizen should have their voices heard, and I should do everything within my power to make sure that that happens. Because I believe that a more inclusive democracy creates a more vibrant one, and a vibrant democracy is good for everybody. So that right there helps orient me that know that, listen, I have to make sure that I am being radical enough to say that everybody should have a, a say. But now here's the other part. What we've done, and I think that that could use a little adjustment, is that our first encounter with voters have uh, traditionally been transactional. We just, you know, when people, when we won, there were so many people that was calling, asking for a list of felons because we want to register felons. And I tell you what, it really started irritating the hell out of me mm. because it felt like I had a target on my back. Mm. And it went against what the campaign was about because because people were looking for felons, it reduced my humanity to being nothing but a token, nothing but another vote in some partisan war. Right. And that's not how you want to react, interact with people for the first time when you talk about voting, hmm. that they're nothing but a vote. They're nothing but a token, you know. And, and so uh, we have to change the way we think and, 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 and get I think we get more uh, what we call transformational encounters. That's what we seek because we believe that, and, and we showed it in Amendment 4, that I can talk to anybody, right? And, and I could really uh, uh, respect their humanity and respect their needs, right? And speak to them, not ignore them and just only speak to my, my kind of people, mm -hmm. but I speak to everyone. And in doing so, we were able to pull over a million, over a million, just think about that. The gubernatorial election was decided by 30,000, a congressional election by about 10,000, a uh, presidential election by 100,000. We pulled a million people who we were traditionally thought would not vote for us, would be against us. Over a million of them said yes on four. Mm. Right. We meet people where they're at. Doesn't mean that is a powerful point to end on. Thank you so much. for your